restores my soul. What a powerful thought that is, to think that God is a restorer of a person's soul. I love the idea of restoration. We've always themed the year, but we didn't just come up with a slogan, something that's quaint or cute. We really sought God and believed for the Holy Spirit to put something on our hearts. And over all those years, many years ago with Scripture, you crowned the year with your goodness. Remember Missio Day? It means on mission. And by the way, we're still on mission now. And so it didn't finish at the end of that year. Pioneer again, believing God to raise up new things. He says, I'll do a new thing, new roads, new rivers. I like that one. That was great. Last year, Holy Spirit significance. And this year, it's rescue, restore, rebuild. Something I got in my spirit New Year's Eve when I sat on a park bench in the dark. And I really believe God put those words and that thought in my heart that God this year is gonna bring incredible rescue to people in danger or peril. That God is gonna restore what has been lost, stolen or taken or plundered. That God is gonna rebuild what the enemy has tried to plunder and destroy. And so that has been our faith goal for this entire year. And I think about those three words. And if I go through them and talk about them, to rebuild literally is the bringing back to a former state, something that has fallen down. He's fallen over. (laughs) By the way, that was a Steve Dixon joke. If you're in Brisbane, ask him. It's uh, probably the worst joke you've ever heard, but it's a Steve Dixon joke. He's fallen over. (laughs) In-house jokes, there's room for it. You know, there's room for it. There's only a few of us in the room after all. Anyway, I'm gonna get back to it. Rebuild is the bringing back to a former state something that has fallen down, fallen into disrepair. To rescue is to save from danger, threat or peril. And to restore is to bring back something that was rightfully yours, but which was taken from you. And all of those things, rescue, restore, rebuild, involve the return of something. Whatever you've lost, whatever has been stolen, whatever has been defeated or destroyed, whatever has been plundered, whatever is in ruins, we believe God for the return of those things. And so I'm believing God to see that happening in our lives, God to restore, God to rebuild, God to rescue people in perilous situations. And we're hearing stories already. I mean, it's already happening. And I'm not necessarily thinking, let's get back things to how they were. I'm believing God for a new normal. I'm believing God that a new normal will be established. Better in quality, better in quantity, better in kind. That God won't just give you what you once have, but that God can do in your life what you never thought you could ever have. Because that's the God we serve. You don't renovate a house and restore a house to make it worse than it used to be. You do it to make it better than it used to be. And that's the whole idea of restoration. God makes it better. Everybody say better. I'm going to America tomorrow, so I'm practising better. It's going to be better. (laughs) In Job, Job 42 verse 10 is the end of the book of Job. And it says what? The Lord restored. What did He do? He restored Job's losses. Not to what he once had. He restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had had before. Let's lift our faith. Let's lift our spirits. Let's lift our expectation. Let's believe that God is bringing restoration into our lives. And what God is gonna do is gonna be beyond. It is a new normal. Even for our church, as we rebuild from the pandemic, I'm not believing God to give us what once was here. We're believing God to do something greater in Jesus' Name, a new normal. You know, anytime the enemy ever tried to attack our church when it came to facilities or buildings, God has always restored not only former fortunes, but like a platform for us to move into a whole new season of blessing and growth and life. So that's what I believe for you. Yes, I do. Yeah, I do. You 
want to know what I'm on? I'm on the Holy Ghost. <laughs> well, listen to me. That new normal. That new normal. <laughs> it's God doing what we just never believed He could ever do or would ever do in our lives. And you know, sometimes after a pandemic or whatever other things trying to bring devastation into your life, so easy to ask God why. You know, why is this happening? Why is this happening? You know what's better? I think the best question always is what? What are you gonna do now? Because it's a question that can be laced with expectation. Not why are we in the situation we're in, but what, Lord? What are you gonna do with this? What's this gonna lead to? What are you bringing to pass in my life? What are you gonna do that's gonna surprise me, shock me, that's extravagant? Because that's what we believe, a new normal. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, all things were together for good to those who love God. I'm speaking to rooms full of people who love God. And some people who maybe are visiting us and you're about to fall in love with God. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. I'll tell you, the purpose part is important because it's a reason God wants to restore in your life. And it connects all the way back to His purpose. I like it in the NIV, the New International Version, the Robert Ferguson Version. <laughs> This is what it says. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. Just a different slant on it. God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. So thank God, that's why our expectation is that God will cause all things to work together according to His purpose. And it's powerful and it's great. And I'm full of faith for it. I'm full of faith to hear your story your story of God's redeeming power, God bringing absolute restoration to something that you thought was gone. You thought you'd lost it. It's amazing how God can restore, what God will restore, the timing in which God will restore. He's gonna surprise you. That new normal, it's on its way. In Jesus' Name, it's on His way. And I already mentioned, He does good things and it's according to His purpose. And I think restoration is always to do with God's purpose. You see, God's purpose cannot be thwarted. I like that word, thwarted. God's purpose cannot be thwarted. God's purpose is unstoppable. God is a God of purpose. Amen. And nothing can get ever in the way of God accomplishing what He set out to accomplish. Nothing can. Especially if we're living in obedience to Him. If we're living in disobedience, that may hinder the purpose of God in our lives. But the truth is, God's Word is God's Word and God's purpose is God's purpose and who God is and what God does in line with His nature and character means He will always rescue or restore or rebuild if it brings us back to His purpose. Yes. <laughs> and I believe you and I in His church, we're right in the middle of God's purpose. What a powerful place to be. Right in the middle, in the middle of God's purpose, unstoppable purpose. I like that idea. Something that's unstoppable, unstoppable purpose. I watched Parramatta do so well this year. And I mean, it's unstoppable purpose. I watched Chelsea up in the Premier League in the UK doing so well, while Arsenal flun flounder. And I know what it is, it's purpose. All things work together. His purposes are good. They're good. And what God's wanting to do in our lives is good. And God throughout history has always been about purpose. I mean, creation. And in Genesis chapter one, God created the heavens and the earth in six days. And in chapter two, He created Adam and Eve along with the tree of life and the tree of good and evil. And by chapter three, Adam and Eve messed it all up. Eve got deceived by the serpent. She convinced her weak husband, Adam, and the two of them ate from that tree they were told not to eat from and they plunged the world into darkness and into devastation and a sense of hopelessness. And it all happened in just three chapters, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. That's how quick it happened. 
And the impact of it was that God banished them from the garden. And they were basically cut off from the tree of life. A sad, sad place to be. But God, who is a restorer, His desire, His heart, His passion for humanity was to restore Eden, to restore creation, to restore life, to restore the tree of life. And so if you don't think God's about restoration and that His Bible, the Bible is just one big book of restoration, have a look at the last chapter of Revelation, the last, the last chapter of the inspired Word of God. And here, through the inspiration of Jesus, John, this is what He says. Chapter 22, verses one to five. It said, He showed me a pure river of water, of life clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life. Was what? The tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for healing of nations. They were banished all the way back in Genesis at the beginning of the Bible from the tree of life but a God of restoration and His great redemptive plan and His great redemptive story. We go from the very beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible and what they'd been banished from, what they'd been cut off from, that tree of life, all of a sudden there it was. John, he could see the tree of life and that's the restoring power of God. He can bring you back to life when you've made choices that were choices of death. And I love that. I love that's the way that God works that He brings us toward life. And you know, God is so forgiving and He's so full of grace. And you look at humanity, really, it's the ultimate backsliding story because I believe backsliders can be restored. People who turn their back on God, He doesn't move, He doesn't change. He changes not, the Bible says, but we can turn. But God, He's always with open arms welcoming us back. And in this great backsliding story, when Adam and Eve, they rejected God and they turned their back and they accepted sin and fear entered into them and so many other things, all of a sudden that were pure suddenly become impure. They suddenly recognise they're naked. Everything changes in that moment. But the wonderful thing is the way that Revelation finishes, that great backslide turns back to the tree of life. God is full of life. He fills us with life. And you know, in Acts chapter three, in Peter's sermon, it's talking about after Jesus had ascended to heaven. And look at what it says in verse 21, heaven must receive Him until the time comes for God to restore everything. What God wanted to do, He wants to restore everything. He wants to restore everything that's been plundered, that lines up with His purpose. Heaven must receive Him until He come. Time comes for God to restore everything as He promised long ago through His holy prophets. And so it's wonderful, it really is. Here's the good news. The good news is that's the big picture. But when it comes to the small picture, your life, that same God who brings restoration will bring restoration to your home, to your family, to your marriage, to your job, to your livelihood, to your business, to whatever it is the devil's trying to plunder. He will restore, He will restore, He will restore. And in particular, when we live in obedience to Him, God restores everything the Bible says, as He promised long ago through His holy prophets. So powerful. And God, as I said, He's been a restorer from the very beginning. You watch Israel's journey. You watch Israel's journey out of Egypt and you watch them in the wilderness and you watch the promises God brings their way. And in Deuteronomy, it talks about blessing and cursing. And blessing comes through obedience and the curses came through disobedience. And here again, the promise is restoration. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse three. It says, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes. I love that. God will restore your fortunes. Maybe you're down on your luck. You just have no good fortune at all. You feel down on your luck. You feel like nothing's ever working out for you. But when you live in obedience to the Lord and this promise is the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations. This was the promise to Israel where He scattered you. And you know what? After one of those seasons where 
Israel was disobedient and it caused years of disaster, but ultimately a restoring God. In Joel 2 verse 25, again, He says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust and the chewing locust. I never knew there were so many types of locusts. He said, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. And that's the thing about God. They'd been disobedient and it did bring a reaping of what they sowed. But ultimately the heart of God is restoration. And you know, tonight, wherever you're at spiritually, wherever you're at in your relationship with God, never forget He's a restorer. No matter how bad you are, that's almost irrelevant because it's all about how good He is. It's not about how unrighteous we may be, but it's just about His righteousness when He willingly gives us so that we become, amen, righteous. And only God can do that. He can restore your righteousness. He can restore your God-given future. He can bring you back in line with His God-given purpose. His purpose cannot be thwarted. His purpose is unstoppable. God is a God of purpose and every good thing works together for good to those not only who love God, but those who are called according to His purpose. How many people here, how many people through the screen there, you believe that God has purpose for your life? Give me an amen. Raise your hand in the air if you believe God's got purpose for your life. Amen. Even in the Gospels, even in the New Testament, so much restoration. Mark 8 verse 25. This is Jesus, obviously. He put His hands on a blind man's eyes again and made him look up and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. That's a big day right there. Don't ever doubt the restorative power of God. Don't ever doubt what God can do to bring restoration in your life because that's the God that we worship. That's the God that we serve. He's not asleep. He's not quiet. Sometimes maybe it feels like God is silent, but I'll tell you, He's never absent. He's always up to something and God can't help Himself because He's a restorative God. And so that's the heart of God. That's what God does. He restores, He restores. You say, well, I messed this up. Well, you know something? Open your heart to a restorative God. His restoration. A restorer is who God is. And to restore, restoring. Restoration is what God does. You know what? There's two two places we need restoration from which really all the restoration in our life will flow. And I'll take the last few minutes of this message just to talk about that. And the first thing is I believe God wants to bring restoration to your spirit. I'm really talking about revival. He wants to bring revival into your heart, personal revival. We just prayed for people that God would restore to them the joy of their salvation. And we can be believing God for restoration in the outward parts of our life. God, I believe You're gonna restore that job that I lost. You're gonna restore this relationship. You're gonna restore that financial situation where I lost that investment and where I was plundered and ripped off. And so we can believe that, but you know where all restoration really starts? It starts in here, from the inside out. And the idea of God restoring somebody's spirit. I'm gonna believe tonight for that to happen. And I'll read the very first. I've been talking about Psalm 51 verse 12. Remember David, David had sinned. David was crying out to God for a clean heart, that God would renew his spirit, that God would uphold him with his God's free spirit. And so he was believing for really a spiritual revival. And in Psalm 51, 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation. It's His salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. I mean, restoration is all about God's generosity. It's not as though we always deserve it. It's always about a generous God and the works of a generous God in us giving liberally. And so, personal revival. There's a guy called Apollos. I think it's Acts 18. What I know is Apollos, he was very smart. He grew up in Alexandria at the mouth of the Nile River. 
had the biggest university of the then known world and the biggest library of the then known world. He was an academic and the Scripture says he was eloquent. He was very articulate. He was a smart man and he studied in the Scriptures. And of course, he was from the elite. He was educated. And along comes a couple of tradespeople. Their names were Priscilla and Aquila. And Priscilla and Aquila start to explain the deeper things of God to Apollos. He knew the baptism of John, but they were talking to him about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, really. About a greater baptism. You know, I couldn't find it this afternoon, but I remember one time actually preaching a message on this and finding a Scripture, I think in the message, where it talked about becoming spiritually alive. And that idea of becoming spiritually alive, restored to us the joy of our salvation is something that grips me. I mean, I've been a Christian since I was five years of age. I've been going to church, like I said this morning, for my whole 67 years. And so sometimes you've got to believe God to just bring freshness and restore the joy and bring that spiritual revival, that personal revival in you. If people in our church have personal revival, then believe me, we'll have a church that's fully in revival. It always starts with people, always. It starts with us. And that same portion of Scripture, it talks about diving deep, diving deep into the deep things of God. I don't think that that means that, well, you just get into, you know, being a little bit more analytical and get really deep into the into, into theology. No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I'm going diving deep into relationship and restoration and the presence of God and the goodness of God. Just diving deep. Let's not be surfacy when it comes to our relationship with God. Let's dive deep. Let's dive headlong into our walk with Jesus. Man, I'm telling you, if a person has revival and we all have personal revival, we will have a church that's in fully fledged revival. It's as simple as that. We always wanted to fall from up there. Lord, send revival. Lord, send it now. Good song. But listen, oftentimes revival starts in here. Amen. This is where it comes from. Amen, in the <laughs> innermost rooms of your valley, rivers of living water shall flow. Amen. We're believing for that spiritual revival. Listen to it in the message. Bring me back from grey exile. Bring me back from grey exile. Put a fresh wind in my sails. Who needs a fresh wind in your sails? I wonder who needs a fresh wind in your sails? It talks there, bring me back from grey exile. You know, our Christian life can become very grey, very beige. I don't like beige. I only like grey in certain circumstances. I like black, I like white, I like red, I like green, I like purple, I like pink. I like yellow with black spots. I mean, I like anything that's got a bit of colour to it. Grey, who wants to be a grey? My Christianity is grey. What, what, what uh, colour? Would you attach to your walk with the Lord? Uh, you might say, vivid green. Yeah, grey, grey. We don't need grey Christians around here. No, bring me back from grey exile. Bring me back from losing my joy. Bring me back from being cold. Give me back my first love, amen. People don't lose their first love. People leave their first love and spiritual revival, God doing something in your spirit, a restoration in here will change everything out there. <laughs> and the other one is restoration in your soul. <laughs> we need a fresh wind. God put wind in your sails. We need a fresh wind. The fragrance of heaven. We need God to pour His Spirit out. That's a good song to sing, by the way, right now. We need a fresh wind. The fragrance of heaven. Pour your Spirit out. Let's believe tonight. We've still got minutes left in this service. We're gonna believe God to pour His Spirit out in this place. Yes, we are. We're gonna believe God to pour His Spirit out. Why not? Why not? Why not? Tell me that. And so, restoration in your spirits, personal revival, but restoration in your soul, the seat of your emotion, the seat of your choices. Choices, our will comes from the area of our soul. 
choices and our thinking. I mean, that's, that's where I believe God wants to do something in our soul. And David prayed it, Psalm 23. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He, lies, lead, he leads me, excuse me, He leads me beside still waters. What does He do? He restores my soul. What a beautiful line. He restores my soul. Let's believe God to bring restoration to our soul. All of a sudden, we're not thinking those anxious thoughts. We're not thinking those negative thoughts. We're not thinking thoughts that are vindictive and picking on other people and getting upset because we don't like what other people are doing. No, God restores your soul. You don't have time for that stuff anymore. Hey, I believe in God for a revival in my soul, for God to bring a restoration there. Because what happens then? All of a sudden, my choices, my, my, my choices, my will is gonna come from a place of a restored soul. Sometimes we make foolish choices because of the condition of our soul. Yes, we do. He restores my soul, the Scripture says. In Proverbs 11, it says, the generous soul will be made rich. And you know, I like that idea. God to bring a wealth to people's soul. The generous soul will be made rich and he who waters will be watered himself. Generosity, like a lot of things, it starts in our soul. And to think of that wealth we can have in our soul. You know, I've been talking about joy. And right now I'm talking about generosity. I'm talking about God making a person rich on the inside. In other words, bringing generosity to your soul. Second Corinthians chapter 8. There the Apostle Paul speaking as an example about the Macedonians. He says, I want to make known to you the grace bestowed on the churches. For people who don't think the church is local, the church is not, you know, places like this. The churches of Macedonia. Then in a great trial of affliction, difficult times, listen, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Two things there in the middle of difficulty and poverty that came, I believe, from a restored soul, a restored spirit, and they were joy and generosity. Listen to it one more time. In a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy in their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality, joy and generosity. Why am I telling you this? Because when somebody has lost that fresh fire, when someone is no longer in personal revival, and when their soul maybe is weary, the first two things they'll lose are their joy and their generosity. You find someone who's not doing well and maybe they're on the way out when it comes to the things of God or even being part of the house of God. And you'll see it. The first thing you'll see is their joy's disappeared. And the second thing you'll see, their generosity. They're not generous, generous with their words anymore. They're cold. They're not generous, they're cold. And that's why I say, God, bring restoration to our heart, bring restoration to our soul, bring restoration to our spirit. Lord, we're believing that You'll restore unto us the joy, the joy of our salvation. And I'm gonna believe God with you, that your spirit and your soul will come alive, that we'll dive deeper into the things of God as we come into this autumn time and we head towards winter. Why don't we make this a time where it may be getting colder on the outside, but we're heating up on the inside because a church full of people with personal revival will be a church that's in full-fledged revival. And it's gotta start in here. That's why we're having mega prayer meetings and all sorts of things coming up. Number one, to storm heaven. But number two, I just think it's wonderful when the people gather and we pray. And again, our spirit's coming alive and we have an expectation and a faith of what God can do. And it's powerful. And so, yes, these are the things we're believing for. We're gonna believe God for that restoration in your spirit and that restoration in your soul. And out from that, I'm gonna believe God to restore vision. You know, Habakkuk, where it speaks of vision, I'll just read it in the message. It says, and then God answered, write this, write what you see. Do you know something? When your soul is jaded, it changes what you see. And often you lose sight of vision. You lose sight of what God had in your heart before. We're believing God to restore. And for God to restore, let's pray 
that He will allow Him to start it in our spirit, in our soul. And so again, we begin to see according to the vision that God put in our heart. It lines up with the good purposes of God because all things work together for good to those who love Him. <laughs> and accord according to His purpose. I'm going to believe God as we've already prayed for restoration of marriages and families and relationships. I'm going to believe God for the restoration of opportunities and creativity and God ideas. I'm going to believe God for the restoration of sick bodies. We already prayed for it. And tired minds. Yeah, tired minds. I'm going to believe for the restoration of momentum and forward progress in your life, in our church, everywhere around and about us. Momentum is a wonderful thing. You take it for granted when you've got it, but you sure miss it when you lose it. And maybe you have momentum in your, in your work, you have momentum in your career, and all of a sudden that's ground to a halt. Amen, restoration is on your way. It's on its way into your life. And the restoration of purpose. Thank God. Your purpose hadn't gone anywhere. It didn't go anywhere. Maybe you just lost sight of it. Do you still have that sense of purpose, God-given purpose? Because God works all things together for good to those who are called according to His good purpose. Amen.